Topping the New York Times bestseller list. The Shack is in the top 40 bestsellers of all history. Having sold millions of copies since its release in 2007, the novel The Shack has become a publishing phenomenon. Now a feature film based on the influential book is to be released in March of 2017. What theology does the book teach? Should faithful Christians be concerned at its impact on the church? Documentary filmmaker Paul Flynn of Megiddo Films has released his latest work, The Shack, Its Dangerous Theology and Error, in an attempt to answer these questions. To watch this film free of charge, please visit our website at megiddofilms.org. That's megiddofilms.org. You're listening to Megiddo Radio. Megiddo Radio is a radio ministry of Megiddo Media. For more, visit our website at megiddoradio.com. That's megiddoradio.com. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. This is Paul Flynn with Megiddo Radio for the 20th of August, 2016. Thank you all for tuning in. On today's show, we're going to be talking about female bishops in the Anglican Church. Now, I've covered this a little bit on the show before, but we have a special guest on today who we hope we can go into more detail on. Um, as I was dealing with, um, I think about two months ago, I was dealing with the Church of Scotland. And it's not necessarily an issue, per se, to do with women in the, in the church. And what I would put it like this is, it's an issue to do with the Bible's authority. Is the church going to follow the Bible or is it not? Or is it going to pick and choose based upon political correctness or what is socially acceptable? Um, the man we have on today is Stephen Holland. He is a minister in England, in Lancashire, I believe. And uh, he's also part of the Protestant Truth Society. Now, you might remember a few months ago, I think it was about six months ago, maybe longer that, than that, Garrod Marley was on the program, and he talked about his testimony, how he's led a road out of Roman Catholicism. So the Protestant Truth Society, which has done tremendous work over the last, I don't know, some 200 years. Um, so I've been meaning to get uh, Brother Holland on for some time. Uh, Brother Holland, thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you, and thank you for having me. It's uh, great to be with you. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> like I said, I was looking for the excuse to get you on, and I saw the mm -hmm. story, and I said, okay, this is this this has to be the uh, the story we, that we cover with you. Now, yeah. just to give a bit of background for people, now, this has been going back a couple of years, and you can uh, just tell us about yourself and other things like that in a minute, but mm -hmm. I came across a story, there was a Kent Online pro uh article which talked about Reverend Stephen Holland protests at consecration of two women bishops, Canterbury Cathedral, and uh, also the Christianity Today was picking up the story. We'll get into those uh, articles later on, but uh, I was like, I was really encouraged because I looked through the videos, and I think one of the things I, I suppose is years ago as a young believer, how do we respectfully, in a God-honoring way, protest against apostasy. We don't want to be vigilantes. We don't want to be starting arguments with the police. But we want to be respectfully respecting the authority, even though they may be ungodly and doing things that are wrong, but we should not break the rules ourselves in order to make our voices heard. The Lord will present, as he did to the apostles and other people, the right time to present. So I was really encouraged. There was some videos on Stephen Holland's YouTube page, but we can talk about that later on. Um, Stephen, for those who, who may have not heard of you, could you just give us a little bit of your background, um, where you're a minister, and um, a little bit about you briefly? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm the pastor of West Horton Evangelical Church, which is a church on the outskirts of Bolton, uh, near Manchester, in the northwest of England. Um, I've been the pastor there for just under 14 years. I've been with the Protestant Truth Society for just over 11 years. Um, I 
were converted at 18, uh, studied uh, firstly with the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, falsely called, um, but I came away from that and uh, became a Christian. Wow, I um, might have to get you on the program for that alone. Okay. <laughs> for another day, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, my, my protests, I, I thoroughly agree with what you said about our approach. Um, and I've been uh, determined right from the very first protest to make sure that um, it's not rude, it's not seen as interruptive. Um, I've made five uh, indoor protests. Well, when I say five indoor protests, uh, four were inside. One of them, um, they barred my entrance and refused me access. Uh, the first protest was at York Minster, um, where I made my protest there. The second protest was again at York Minster, but the plainclothes policeman um, barred my entrance to the minster on authority of the dean. My third protest was at St. Paul's in London. Uh, that, that was uh, inside. Um, my fourth protest was at Westminster Abbey in London. They initially refused me entrance, but when I gently tried to argue my case, one of the security ladies said, do you want me to go and ask one of the bishops? She came it's back amazing. Seemed... You need you need uh, permission now from the church to express a biblical permission, and like this yeah. is we're not talking about we're disagreeing over eschatology or something like that. Mm. We're talking about First Timothy chapter two verse twelve, yeah. which hasn't you know what you have to do to torture that verse in yeah. order to make it say something different or. Mm. And and centuries of church history, and it's kind of been tossed aside, but. I, but yeah. before you get on, just on the your protest, yeah. What led you before you began the protest? What say? How did you you know like because we can't protest everything, can we? We we, we no, wouldn't no. have time in the day. <laughs> um, no, right. But what led you to protesting this? Yeah. Okay, Paul. Well, the the ultimately it it was years of frustration um, of what appeared to be at least on the surface nobody saying anything. So when I heard that they were going to consecrate um, the first woman bishop, um, that was my intention then to protest that as nobody else seemed to be doing very much. But for some strange reason, I couldn't find out when that actually was. But I was due to attend a minister's fraternal um, on a Monday morning. And just as I was tying my shoelaces up, came on the radio that Libby Lane was to be made the first woman bishop. So I thought, oh, well, it's too late now to get there. But in God's providence, there was a protest that was actually made at uh, her consecration. Um, so then I, I thought, well, I'll do an internet search and I'll find out when the next uh, woman bishop is to be consecrated and I would protest that. But to get to your, your question, it was really out of frustration, years of frustration, um, seeing what is in effect, of course, our national state church, um, where people see that as Christian. I mean, if there's any national disaster or any problem, if they want a Christian response, it's generally from the local vicar who, who gives an uptake. And you sort of feel well, that there seems to be hardly a genuine Christian response to these things. So um, the whole purpose of doing it was really out of frustration that nobody else seemed to be doing anything. Mm. Do, I'm just curious, did you have any um, like family members or anything like that? Like, I'm just wondering, what is the state of the Church of England? Are, are we talking, is it the vast minority go, or is it like the, the Roman Catholic Church over here where... People kind of speak ill of it, but will still kind of go, kind of thing like that? Yeah, I, I think um, the, the Church of England is, is by its own admission, um, hitting a crisis point. Um, it said itself, now how accurate this is, I'm, I'm not sure, but one report stated that there were six Church of England uh, places of worship closing every week. Oh, wow. Uh, and that's quite common to see even where I live in Lancashire, and I've seen it in other places, 
what used to be church meeting places, church buildings, are now turned into houses or into some other complex. Um, so it, it's very much aware itself that it's on a crisis of struggling spiritually. Now, that's not just true of the Church of England. There are many independent and even denominational evangelical churches that are obviously suffering from the spiritual climate and the spiritual drought that, that we're actually experiencing. But whereas, I forget the last census, but it's certainly at one point a few years ago, maybe 10 or more years ago, when they took the last census, apart from the previous one, there was something like 75 or thereabout percent who claimed to be Christian. Many of those would say C of E, Church of England. Mostly, most people would only go for a funeral or for a wedding or for a christening. Um, so it's obviously, it's hemorrhaging like a lot of places uh, today. But there is, there is an evangelical, um, for want of a better word, section of the Church of England where there are good uh, solid men who would be Bible men, would be Christians, would be born again, and probably even the odd one or two bishops. But I suspect that most of the bishops um, would be very much liberal in their theology or at least feel that a Christian is just simply somebody who does good to their fellow man. Yeah, as a former independent Baptist, and I got saved into independent Baptist mm. churches, I think we kind of just kind of dismissed and we looked at some of the Protestant churches that were kind of going extremely liberal and we kind of got, you know, almost, you know, to my shame, I'm even thinking as like, oh, they're all lost or all like that. Yeah. But there are some godly men. Now, sometimes it takes something big to push them out because they really want to be that preservative salt um, yeah. in the wound, you could say, you know, in order to, pre you know, preserve things from getting any worse. I don't agree yeah. with the... The thinking behind it, but you know they're not they're not charlatans or anything like that. They're no, sincere, no. godly men who are trying to do their best as yeah, they I see mean, it. Yes, yeah, so, so some of them would remain in it. I mean, it was it was Lloyd Jones's point of view that people shouldn't be in mixed denominations; you should come out and separate. But I believe his point was, but if you were determined to go into the Church of England, then you must make your stance, because all being men as we are, there's always the temptation to maybe go in to make a stance, but when you get in, you end up not doing very much. And, and basically, a, a lot of good men in the Church of England are, are basically just like your ordinary independent evangelical church. They just get on with their own business, um, running the, their own congregation, overseeing the flock that's there and forgetting about the wider picture. But my own point of view is, well, if you're going to be in it, then you need to make a stand while you're in and use those opportunities because there are liberal groups, which is we'll get to in a moment, that's mm. trying to stop me from protesting. They're not quiet and they're, they're not taking a back seat. You know, they're not living and let live. They're very much on the protest to advance. They preach it, uh, but it's not really happening. It's like live and let live. Oh, mm. you know, you know, love us, you know, like and just accept us and all this kind of stuff, even though that, that isn't love anyway. But mm, that's, that's right. you know, like, I don't want to kind of say, okay, there's a lot of hypocrisy. Of course there is. And uh, well, I, I suppose, and, and I can kind of understand, you know, those good men we're talking about going to the Church of England, willing to make their stand, who would, mm. you know, sincerely hold to the 39 articles. We might talk about those in a while. Yeah. But, you know, that they're Christian articles. They claim to hold to a Christian confession. So, but the thing is, it's so hard because, you know, like, there gets a time, I suppose, when you're younger, you got more energy and yeah. you don't mind fighting as much. But as time goes on, you get tired of it. And I suppose, I guess, if anybody's yeah. listening to this and maybe kind of going, and I've actually had emails from young people, yeah. uh, even late teens, and talking about, you know, and the kind of theology they talk about, the very kind of Martin Lloyd-Jones-esque, mm. very kind of like the Puritans, but kind yeah. of would want to go into the Church of England to make a stand. Mm. You've got to realize how difficult it's going to be. And, yeah. you, know, yeah. you know, you've got to factor all these things in. Yeah, I mean, it, it's even difficult within society because of political correctness. And you can't say this and you can't say that. So those that are of a more liberal wing within the C of E, um, they've obviously caved into the world, which contradicts Romans chapter 12, be not conformed to this world. And sadly, um, in a sense, the, those of a liberal persuasion, we can say, have got the world on their side. So anybody who goes into that 
doesn't just have the world against them, but you've also got professed Christians who are, and they do have an agenda uh, to make everything all inclusive, all tolerant of everything, which of course is not the gospel, because the gospel isn't uh, tolerant of everybody and of everything and of every belief system. You know, the Christian message is an offense to the natural man, and the Christian message is exclusive, and it is direct, and it is dogmatic. Um, so if, if anybody's going to go into the Church of England, then you need to be prepared to go in and to make a stand uh, for these things. I, I thought at times as well, it, it's, it's a pity that a, an independent uh, Baptist nonconformist um, has to make a stand out of frustration because nobody else seemed to be saying anything or nobody else appeared anyhow to be doing anything. I mean, the, the Anglican Church in Africa, I mean, they, they are a credit um, to the whole Anglican Communion. I mean, they seem to be one of the few uh, Christians that are actually making a stand uh, on certain issues and are making a stand against the way the Anglican Church is going. But as I said to one um, Anglican vicar who came up to me outside York Minster and asked why I was there, why I made the protest, so I shared with him my concerns. And I said, well, your next battle is actually going to be uh, over homosexuality. And instead of looking horrified, or in, he just beamed with a big smile, oh. nodded, and said, I know. So, so you're up against that if, if you're... And they're preparing for it. That's the, well, I won't say the scary thing, but they're, mm. they're planning two or three steps ahead. And there's times when some of these people in the LGBT movement, they'll just admit mm. it and they'll say, I don't want to lie. I don't want to make my life a kind of a fiction. Yeah, we're, Mm. you know, like with the same-sex marriage thing, there was one prominent LGBT activist who said, you know, we're not only just trying to redefine marriage, we're also trying to destroy it. And she's quite candid about it. She she didn't Mm. want it to exist. She she mentioned how there was five parents in her family and all this kind of stuff. It's it's, it's horrendous. But um, I suppose maybe just for people... See, I know from my own background, I'm going to... most people are going to go, ah, but the Church of England's been in trouble for ages. You know, people go back mm-hmm. to the Oxford movement, even some of Spurgeon's mm-hmm. um, writings against the Church of England. But it was a Calvinistic Reformed Church. Mm. At one yeah. point, the 39 Articles. Um, and if anybody wants to study that, I don't know if you've ever read Gus's Top Lady's um, history on the Church of England, mm-hmm. but it's excellent. And he kind of goes through all... A lot of he starts with the church fathers. Now, I think the church fathers weren't probably consistently Calvinistic. There was elements of it, mm-hmm. and then later on, you've got the mid, Middle Ages, and then Calvin, who is much more systematic with it all. Yeah. But, but if you look, and I mean, Top Lady's work is excellent. I believe on it, he just goes through a lot of it's quotes from Fox's Book of Martyrs. Yeah. But in Fox's Book of Martyrs, he quotes all these Calvinist. Um, Church of England forefathers who mm. were talking about those chosen before the foundation were trusting in, you know, making their calling election sure. And it would just how much the Church of England has fallen. I mean, it's a battles with Arminianism all the way through and it become yeah, weaker yeah. and weaker. But um, yeah. so I mean, it, it, in, yeah. in a sense, the, the, the Church of England has never been, you know, as we would say, quote, you know, totally formed or totally pure. Um, but uh, no church on earth you know, we'll, we'll have everything right and be pure right the way all through its history. When you think of even things like Methodism and even the great movements that have come, that they, they've been raised up by God, then they've just simply um, died off and fallen away and fallen into error. So uh, we're, we're conscious that um, there'll be no perfect church or perfect branch of the church, but at the same time, um, truth is there and truth to be contended for and within the church, whether it's the Anglican church or whether it's um, a de- non-denominational church or whatever it is, we're always having to strive um, to fight for the gospel and to preach the gospel and to lay truth bare uh, for all to see and, and not, not to just sort of hide away and be tolerant of everything. Yeah, and I guess I guess one of the reasons I kind of pointed out before we get into the your protest in full, mm. it's just because I kind of know, especially with the modern day, the internet, everyone's a scholar, everybody's putting yeah. things up every five seconds later. I mean, that where possible, we should be gracious. Where possible. I mean, I want to, if there's Anglicans out there, I would like to, 
you know, we'd like to be a blessing to you mm-hmm. and, we, you know, encourage you in going in the right direction, whatever that is. Um, if you're an Armenian and you're going in the right direction, whatever, but even the Westminster Confession of Faith um, mm-hmm. talks about the purest churches under heaven are subject both to mixture and error. Now, and then it talks about later in the next section, that's chapter 25 of the Westminster Confession, of eventually they do, dis- they do um, there comes a point where they're no longer churches of Christ, and I suppose mm-hmm. that's what, something we're trying to avoid, and they become what the... the the Bible calls synagogues of Satan. Okay, yeah. so let's yeah. um, get into your protest in full. So you have protests, what is it, seven, at least I read in one article, seven out of ten? Yeah, yeah um, so there, there have been ten so far women who've been consecrated to the office of bishop. Um, Reverend Paul Williamson, he protested the first one, that was Libby Lane. Um, the other two, um, they got those in very quickly, so... Uh, but by the time I got a chance to organize the protest of number two and three, um, it had already taken place. But all of the other seven um, have been protested uh, by myself. Um, I don't quite know when the next, the 11th um, woman is to be uh, consecrated. Um, I think uh, time will tell, but it seems to have been a mad rush on their part to consecrate as many women as possible. I thought if it keeps going at this rate, it'll be 100% uh, women. And But it's amazing because I think they are struggling, are they, not for like bishops? And they're just, I was just astonished. I was like, whoa, one minute there's the first, and now there's 10. Yeah. It's like it's like a, a dam breaking. Yeah, they're, 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 all, they're all coming at once. Um, um, and I mean, like, I don't know. Do you know the profile of these women? Are they kind of like people who would knock in the door? Like, I mean... It's astonishing. Some of them, yeah. What 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 normally happens is when um, a woman, I suppose it's the same with the men. Whenever they're uh, chosen or appointed uh, to to be a bishop, you, you'll get a general rundown of the person's life, um, what college they were educated in, uh, which diocese they they first served at, where they served as a curate, and generally a little bit about their backgrounds, what they did in secular work, whether they're married, whether they're single, if they have children or not. So, so you get a little bit of a brief biography of whoever it is that's going to be uh, consecrated. Has there been any, uh, not to change subject too much, but ha- yeah. do you know of any kind of, there's always the kind of the watershed event that, you know, like breaks the dam, you know, like there's the first uh, female bishop. Yeah. I was reading the book, I think it was Robert Randall, I don't know if you ever heard of the book, uh, came out there a few months ago, uh, but Banner of Truth put it out. It's a very good book about. Yes, um, uh, yes I've read it. Yeah, it's excellent. Oh, you know, it's excellent. It's really, really insightful into it, and recommend it anybody who wants to, you know, see what's happening in the Church of Scotland to get it. Yeah, absolutely. But, but that he talks about, you know, the there was the the case, was it not, um, of there was a homosexual man openly. Was he clergy? Mm. I can't remember now. Off the top of my head. He was uh, clergy, and it was a refusal. And I think this is the you know the point of the importance of church discipline. Once church discipline yeah. fails, yeah. you get kind of I suppose unrepentant yeah. sinners yeah. kind of taking over the church. Yeah, I, I, th- I think that that was the case in Aberdeen, um, where the, where they appointed a, a, an openly homosexual man. I mean, I, I, I've sort of been critical over the years of. For example, the Church of Scotland, but which is is has declined and has moved into error uh, a lot more than the Church of England has at present. Um, and I'd been maybe unfairly too critical of of men that remained in the Church of Scotland. But having read Randall's book, um, I could see his position in that they remained within the Church of Scotland because it had not publicly on mass or officially condemned or departed from any of its articles of faith or its teachings. Um, but of course, now it is at the highest level sanctioned uh, same-sex marriage and um, homosexual behavior. Um, so then many of the men have seen that, well, now the church has basically apostatized. Mm. And compare that with the Anglican Church, it's not denied its 39 articles. 
it's not as a whole church as a whole it's not departed from the bible it, it still claims in its articles and it still uses of course the book of common prayer um still in operation although there will be for i'll give you an example a, a young man he's retired now but he was spent more most of his adult life as a vicar within the church of england he said as a young man he remembered his bishop saying quote and i quote what he said to me he says that the bishop said we've got to sign these ghastly art articles because you have to sign them by law and of course the young vicar says well i'm afraid i actually believe them you see so that, that's going back a long time ago where people said we don't believe these things and we cross our fingers when we have to sign them but the guilt there is on the individual that denies those articles, but the articles are still there, and, and the fundamentals of the faith are supposedly still adhered to. So my pro I mean, some people have said, why bother, you know, to, to protest? It's apostatized, just leave it alone. Well, my thoughts are, well, it's still, it's, it is the state church. It's what people publicly see as being Christian. Um, therefore, there's still room for protest, and there are many sincere believers. I mean, I've had people stop me in the street, like in Canterbury, to ask, were I the man that just protested? And when I spoke to them, uh, and of course they asked me why I protested, and when I explained to them the reason for protesting, they sort of came around and said, oh, I see what you're saying now, and I understand. And I said, well, your next battle will be this. Mm. Uh, and to which they looked horrified. So, so there are people within the church of england who are maybe a bit naive but they're sincere uh, and they're they're listening to leaders within the church of england being led astray and there appears to be no opposing voice to say at least at the minimum to say hold on a second there is another viewpoint let's hear that viewpoint um rather than them just going hook line and sinker into error uh, without there be any real opposition. Yeah, there needs to be there needs to be opposition, but there needs to be uh, a godly opposition. It can't mm. like and, and one of the things that does a lot of damage is you get one person maybe might be on YouTube or something like that. He'll have a camera and he looks like he's yeah. being manhandled into a police car or something like that. Yeah. And the problem yeah. is, uh, you know, and everybody be sharing around the video and I would look at the video again and I was like, no, he was giving a lot of lip to, you know, like I'm yeah. I'm, I'm thinking one particular or I'm not going to mention names or anything. Yeah. And he, he yeah. was giving the police a lot of trouble and I, and I was just like, yeah. like, don't be sharing around that guy's video. I, You know, to be honest, mm -hmm. I was like, he's in the wrong there. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I've seen some of those videos and I think, well, you deserve to get arrested. Yeah. You deserve to get put in, into a, a van and you deserve to get taken away. But do some um, people want to be martyrs? I mean, and oh, that's yeah. really, really dangerous yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, that, 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 that's why I'm getting back to the, to, to the protest where right from day the first protest, I was very careful. Number one, I would not interrupt anybody's speech. You know, so I wouldn't interrupt in any part of a sermon which I have to sit through or anything else, I would wait. Um, now, the first two, three protests, I think it was, I came in after they say the Apostles' Creed. Because then after they say the Apostles' Creed, there's a lengthy gap of silence. And it was then that I stepped in and said, just two seconds of your time, and I would make my protest, then I would be escorted out without any resistance or, or any further ado. But then I noticed in the order of service that there's actually a point in the service where they quote, ask, is it now your will that so-and-so be ordained? The congregation then responds, it is our will. And that's when I would come in and say, no, in the name of Almighty God, I protest. There are no women bishops in the Bible. Then I would quote um, from 1 Timothy 2 verse 12. Then I would name the person who's being uh, consecrated. So it would be Mrs. So-and-so. And I would say, um, you are an imposter. You are a usurper. The Church of England may ordain you, but God never. Mm. And then, well, it's then I quote the verse, then I 
I'm generally then escorted out. But I'm very careful not to interrupt. That. It's not a screaming match. Um, I'm not a protester in that sense of the word. I'm just somebody who answers the question, uh, is it now your will that Mrs. So-and-so be ordained? They say it is, then I make my peaceful protest. Then I get straight away out of the cathedral, wherever it is I am, and I go away and I leave them then to themselves to get on with their service. But you see the same thing with the apostles as well. I mean, they are, Stephen's given the opportunity in Acts chapter 7. Mm-hmm. You see Paul is given the opportunity before the crowd. He asks. He doesn't just barge his way through. So mm-hmm. we we have to just trust we're going to, okay, submit ourselves in maybe they're wicked at times and lots of things like that to earthly rulers. But the Lord will provide the opening. The yeah. Lord will provide. And it's just a matter of taking that opportunity. And I, I thought it was great when you waited they basically ask the congregation. And yeah. so if 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 there's anything is going to be an introduction or kind of um, asking somebody to raise an objection, it would be definitely mm-hmm. be there. Yeah, but what, what they're going to try to do now is, um, which may take an act of synod, um, I'm just picking up on some legal bits that people have said, that ecclesiastical lawyers, that um, they're going to try now and remove that from the service. Uh, because it's not apparently a legal requirement to ask, is it now your will that yeah. they be ordained? So they're in talks now amongst themselves where that they're going to drop that from the service. But I, which, I I think, you know, but even them doing that, that will speak mm-hmm. volumes, I think, to the, you know, if the, those who are the remnant within the Church of England, yeah. I think that will probably go, whoa, they're trying to silence somebody yeah. who's just sharing the word of God. Yeah, yeah, that, that's it. But, but even, I mean, from a technical point of view, um, that wouldn't, um, I mean, I'm assuming I may not be allowed in, in which case they, they can say it or not, would make no difference if I'm not there. But um, as far as the service going, removing that point, is it now your will, wouldn't make any difference because the next sentence is, will you now pray for so and so? Which, of course, if I wanted to, I mean, if you wanted to come in at a golden opportunity and the, the congregation then says, yes, we will, well, I could equally then come in and say, no, I won't. You've thought about you this see. one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, so so on a technical point of saying, look, you know, there, there wasn't, you know, there, there'll still be a question that, that they, I mean, I, I, I've no intention or desires to get them to change anything. Hmm. Um, you know, that that's not my purpose. My purpose is to, because not being, of course, an Anglican, not being on synod, um, there is no um, there is no voice of opinion um, for a nonconformist who's not part of the Church of England. Now, people may say, as I was asked uh, just yesterday, uh, some people may say, "Well, you're not an Anglican, so what's it got to do with you?" Well, the point is that I'm first of all a Christian, and as a Christian. I'm making my protest, whether it's in the Anglican church or a Baptist church. I mean, I, I don't make protests everywhere. This is just the first, you know, official sort of protest I, I've done. But people say, why the Anglican church? Well, number one, it's the state church, and I'm, I'm a citizen of the state. And the state church, whether you agree with having a state church or not, but I mean, the fact is we've got what is called a state church, with the human head of the church is the queen. So uh, even that itself, I feel, would allow me the right to make a protest Mm. because I'm a citizen of the state. Humanly speaking, the queen of the Church of England or or the head of the Church of England is the queen. But more to the point is I make the protest because I'm a Christian. So my Christian protest is made in the Church of England. A person is, even if they are Anglican, they are a Christian first they're an Anglican second. And it's the same with whatever group or denomination you, you belong to. So, so my protest is, is made. And also, as I think I also hinted at, um, Joe Public, the first thing when he thinks of Christian is Church of England. Mm. And there, there is nobody counteracting the false impression of what an Anglican is. Because they are, in a sense, even going against the, the Council of Nicaea. They're going against 
it, 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 you know, even not just scripture, but they're going against that, which also thinking from a theological point of view. And how can they claim apostolic secession and all this kind of thing if they're going to completely abandon that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, 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 the, the, the gentleman who made the first protest, um, that was one of his points. I mean, he, he made a great opening line. Of course, the, the thing is, with the first protester, um, who's well known, apparently, within Anglican circles uh, for protesting, um, he required permission first from the church to protest, which they allowed him to do that. But then his first opening words were, no, not in the Bible. And then he asked permission from the Archbishop, from the Bishop of York to speak, permission to speak. Well, of course, uh, Bishop Centrum said no. He refused him permission to speak, and then he read what had become law. So that really was, in fact, their way of silencing him. But, of course, me not being um, restrained by the authorities of the Anglican Church, you know, I suppose I was left with maybe a bit more liberty because I didn't ask permission, you know, to begin with. But it's gone back to the prior to the Reformation. I mean, mm. you know, Tyndale asks the bishop to, can he, can he go translate the Bible? I mean, yeah. It, it, yeah I mean, yeah. within Anglicanism, the, 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 the bishop does have a, a lot of clout. Obviously, he has a lot of authority. Um, certainly when a young man, or, or a woman, as we're speaking about women, um, are ordained at the first point of call, um, it, it's up to the bishop whether they say yay or nay. Mm. I mean, it's a bit different. If a man then becomes ordained, then he, he obviously um, can almost be his own man. Um, and if he wanted to, could make the bishop's life difficult. But mm. still, the bishop does carry a lot of authority and a lot of clout within the Anglican Church. But although it claims to uh, be a broad church and have a wide range of opinions, um, it's obviously taken one opinion, which is we will ordain uh, women, which I believe is against the teaching of the Bible. But it's not a secondary point because the hermeneutic that is used, the method of interpretation to uh, twist the Apostle Paul's teaching, is the same hermeneutic method of interpretation that's now being used to justify same-sex relationships, same-sex marriage. So it's the thin edge of the wedge when they, when they, because when they first ordained women in 1994, I think it was 93, 94, one of the reasons was obviously to keep abreast with modern times. And also they believed it would be the savior of the church in the sense that it would stop the decline of the churches will becoming more culturally relevant. But the problem is the church has declined drastically mm. since they ordained women to the office. And it's just going to get worse. I mean, from yeah. a human point of view, it's the devices of men, you know, they try, you know, we can talk about pragmatism, but it, it's not mm. even pragmatically working. You know, it's no, people no, talk about no. pragmatism, get people in the doors and all this. Yeah. But yeah. That's what and happens some... with liberalism. It just becomes completely irrelevant after a while. It, it, that's right. I mean, it, it, it's all it's it's all been tried and tested before, you know, with the social gospel uh, and all the rest of it. It did have an initial success to begin with, but then it just basically emptied the church because you've emptied the gospel of, of its any real power in order to save a person, uh, and therefore people can see through that and people see that there's no power in a social liberal gospel. It doesn't have any power. The only power that is there is in the real gospel which has a power to change a person's life from darkness to light and people can see that but the social gospel has nothing whatsoever to offer our world and so so my call also uh, again is part of my protest um is church of england i say this when i'm going out church of england return to the bible and preach the gospel because i mean that's not just the answer to the church of england but to every part of the church is Amen. to preach the gospel. Now, that doesn't mean you'll have overnight success because, generally speaking, our nation is under judgment, as is the case with Europe. And we're thankful in China, South Korea, um, many 
parts of Africa, you know, that the church is, is blossoming, the Lord is blessing. But it seems in our Western society where we've had the gospel for so long, we've had so much of the Bible, we've rejected it. Little wonder then that the Lord is pouring out his judgment upon us. But our job as Christians is to remain faithful to the gospel, to make the gospel clear and plain and certain before our world. Uh, like someone once said, your responsibility to believe the gospel and to flee to Christ for forgiveness is God's prerogative when he decides to answer. Mm. Uh, because God is sovereign. Um, people don't decide to be saved. God elects, but man is to call. And, and therefore, we are to preach the gospel and we trust in God's own time and in God's own way, he will bless that and we'll reap a harvest. Have you ever at the doors, okay, say these people are stopping you from entering into the different places where these um, consecrations are called, yeah, uh, uh, ordinations yeah. of bishops. Mm -hmm. Have they ever like come to you with the, well, that's not what the Apostle Paul said. And have they ever tried to argue scripture with you or is it just like scriptures are relevant? What's... No, the, 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 the only person um, that has come to me and asked to see me was at Canterbury Cathedral, and he's one of the canons within the Church of England. He has quite a high position. Um, he has asked, uh, would I be prepared to meet with them to discuss this mm. matter? Uh, so I said yes. So we've arranged, and I'm due to meet the said gentleman uh, next month. Uh, to discuss my my ongoing protests. Yeah, and everybody um, listening, keep that in your prayers. And uh, please do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but nobody be, because in in one sense, um, because my 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 protests obviously. I mean, when I first did them, they weren't aware I were coming. I just popped up. Um, I just worked my way to the front. What everybody was saying, the Apostles' Creed, because they were all looking down on their paper. I walked to the front. And then while there was that lengthy period of silence, just then I interrupt, then I would take him straight out. So, so there wasn't really any opportunity for somebody to come and say, look, oh, okay. theologically, you know, um, it, it's, it's not quite So correct. nobody talked to you. I'm just like, and another thing that kind of, um, as I read through, I read through any articles I could find about you online, um, Christianity today, they don't seem to give any opinion. If I looked at it, it would look like they're leaning towards the other side, but um, yeah, what has been, has any other Christian media reached out to you, been supportive, or what's been the general vibe from people right. contacting you? Okay, interesting you should say that, because a couple of hours ago, I had a phone call from the Roman Catholic paper called The Tablet. And uh, they've, they've obviously got wind of my protest, so uh, they want uh, to do a small little piece on my view on it, so I'll be ringing The Tablet. Uh, tomorrow, and uh, they wanted to do just a little article on my protests. Because, you see, because um, because the Archbishop, uh, uh, well, it wasn't him that made it public. It, it's a group called Watch, called Women and the Church. I think it's more precisely, or more correctly, they, they would be described as women against the church, but it's a very liberal, <laughs> yeah. left-wing feminist movement, and they are the ones who are pressuring the Archbishop and the authorities to stop me. Because at Saint at Westminster Abbey, I, I were given a microphone. At Canterbury Cathedral, it was publicly announced that I would be officially protesting. So this movement watch has obviously it's got their backup, and, and they are uh, sorry about that. That's the dog. That's okay. They, they they are now pressurizing the authorities to get me stopped, um, and it wasn't the Archbishop or the official. Church of England that released a statement that they're going to try and ban me. It was this liberal feminist movement that have said the Archbishop is going to stop him. Okay. And then Christian Today contacted me and said, I think they've done about three different articles on this. Um, so in fairness to them, in one of those articles, that they quoted basically everything I said and what my view was. Um, there was another article that were basically just the um, watches women against women and the church. It was 
just their point of view and a little bit about me. But then the other article was basically mostly about what I said in response. And then the third article was they released um, information to the press to say that the Archbishop of Canterbury is going to try and stop me. But that's not what he has said, and that's not yet been officially um, released by the Church of England. So it's come from a third source that they're going to try and stop me. But of course, that, that's not been bad because Radio Lancashire, I was on Radio Lancashire yesterday mm. for about 10 minutes. They'd got wind of it that the Archbishop of Canterbury were going to stop me protest and when they realized i were from lancashire they thought oh we'll get this guy in and we, we'll hear his point of view so it, it hasn't it, it hasn't done any harm that they've come out and trying to get but i, I think it's a shame that um that they're, they're trying to do this because they, they claim to be fighting for women and for women's rights that they're, they're not fighting for women's rights i mean i don't know who made this feminist movement to be the spokesman for women there are many many women who hold to a conservative evangelical position on women in the church. And a really good example of that was in the United States, there was a conference of several thousand women. It was run by women, for women, and women gave papers. Some of them were um, accomplished authors. What was their papers on? What we call a complementarian view of women's roles within the church, which is women should not be teachers or preachers or elders or ministers of the gospel in the church. And this was coming from a conservative uh, group of many women who hold the same position that, that the church has traditionally held regarding women in leadership. So this, this left-wing movement, you know, they're very intolerant. Mm. Nobody else has to have a viewpoint. They, they alone must have their viewpoint. And that's why, obviously, I've upset the apple cart because I've made a protest. But it's largely this group that's trying to get me stopped. Yeah, it's almost like they claim to represent everybody, mm. but <laughs> they just basically drown everybody out. Um, yeah. I just want to give you an idea, uh, just for people listening, uh, some of the one of the comments that were made, it, this is from Christianity Today from the 9th of August. And it's you know it's just amazing how... You know, I, I saw it was like a meme or something on the internet. It was like basically a couple hundred years ago, people would be complaining about the plague or something really, really serious. Now it's we're offended. Um, Such interruptions create the perception that the church is willing to allow a woman who has been called by God and the church, amazing how they do that without the Bible, and appointed by the crown be to be publicly, this is this really astonished me, publicly insulted and undermined. And I watched the video, and if, if the other protests are anything like the video that's on your YouTube channel, there was no yeah. insulting. You were very no. gracious. You didn't say anything about the person in general. You just said, this is against the word of God, and that yeah. should be pretty clear. The, the, yeah. the issue here is, again, we have to bring you back to, this is not saying women are not as valuable as men or no, anything no. like no. that. This is about the authority of the Word of God. This was the mm. problem in the Church of Scotland. The Church of Scotland accepted female ministers decades ago they yeah. told everybody that oh well you know if you can have different points of view then they eventually force people who disagree with them to accept mm. it and it, they, they talk about peace and tolerance but it never actually happens but no no it doesn't but even if it did happen even if it did happen we should still be against it yeah yeah i mean the 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 the, the, the that, that quote that you gave actually was a direct quote from this group called watch um, while I were making my protest, uh, the chairwoman, or the chairman, using use that uh, uh, word as a general uh, word for male and female, she came running out of the crowd screaming at me. Well, I was so concentrating on what I wanted to say because I didn't want to fluff my words. You know, uh, I, I hardly even noticed. Um, so uh, it's like that, that they would be trying to silence my view and one of their objections to me protesting was, look, it's now law. You know, the church has approved it. But hold on a second. Since the founding of the Church of England, it has been law that women are not to be ministers, are not to be bishops. That never stopped these uh, groups, narrow-minded groups, from protesting. They've been protesting all along against something which was you know, in favor, it had the law 
on its side. And just by so her saying that, it's it's admitting that no, we're not sola scriptura anymore. We're sola ecclesia. We're we're just the church is the authority and will interpret exactly what parts of the Bible are followed and what 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 are we're not followed. And that's the same position of the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come. On. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, just uh, just to catch up on one of the points he said, um, this is not saying, uh, as you, as as we'll all agree with, it, it's not saying that women are second class. It's not saying that women don't have a position in the church. It's not saying that that women are inferior. Uh, I, I think one of the uh, points that Paul makes in one Corinthians chapter eleven, where he says that uh, the man is the head of the woman, Christ is the head of the church, the God is the head of Christ. So if we start playing around and saying, no, the woman can be the head of man by being in an authoritative leadership role within the Church of Christ, then we've turned it on its head. So if man is no longer the head of the woman, as God has described, then maybe Christ is no longer the head of the Church, and the Father is no longer the head of Christ. So it has real serious theological issues when we mm. start playing with these things. I mean, uh, the, the, son, uh, the Father is the head of the Son as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. The Son is not inferior to the Father. They're, they're co-equal and co-eternal. So I just want to make that point clear. It's nothing to do with equality or inferiority or ability. Because the if you do believe that Father. submission is um, inferior or subhuman or whatever, then you have to do away with the Trinity. I mean, yeah, Well, yes, exactly. Exactly. I mean, Jesus submitted to the Father. Um, so we can't kind of go with that. You see, uh, you know, I think it's it's the spirit of the age. Unfortunately, we're so we the idea of submission is seen yeah. as a kind of a, a horrible slavery, whereas yeah. the Christian does it willingly, full of joy, if their heart is right before God. But it's, I just want to read for anybody maybe listening in and is not aware of uh, the words of the Apostle Paul written on the inspiration of God in 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verse 11, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. That doesn't need commentary. You know, there's parts of the scriptures that we're kind of going, okay, we can, you know, faithful Christians can disagree on this. This isn't one of these parts. This is no. either you believe the Bible or you don't. Um, we're not talking about parts of Zechariah or something. We're mm -hmm. talking about plain, and there's other parts of scripture that's consistent with this all the way through, that, yeah. you know, women are not to be in, in authority. And again, it's not saying that they're better or worse or anything else. No, no. And no. there's probably women who would do a much better, finer job than most men oh, yeah. in authority. But that's yeah. not their, But that's not our call to say who should and who shouldn't. If you're in your if you're in your home and you're the man and you're the the husband, you're to lead your home. You don't get a mm. choice to pass it off to your wife. So I mean, it's it's not again. It's not an issue about inferior, superior. It's an issue of the authority of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and you you touched on just a few minutes ago. Uh, one of the problems it sees within much of the contemporary church is we, to paraphrase what Paul says in Romans twelve, we're allowing the world to squeeze it, squeeze us into its mold, and rather than allowing the scriptures to be the authority on these matters, we're allowing political opinion, political correctness, our contemporary culture to squeeze it into its own mold, which is the last thing the church should ever do. I mean, the, the church is, uh, when she's popular, the church has never been effective. I mean, we don't want to go out of the way to be unpopular, but our first priority is to be faithful to Christ, to be faithful to his word, and to stand on that, and, and not allow the ungodly culture to influence us and to squeeze us into its own mold. Because it's amazing, we're capitulating to the world, and at, at the same time, you know, in different parts of the world, they're crying out for revival. But mm. it's like saying, okay, revival doesn't depend on what we do, it depends on God, it's the sovereign mm. work of the Holy Spirit uh, pouring out upon, um, when it does come, multitudes of people, that, you know, there's nothing to restrain God by saving by fewer and by many. But the thing about it is, revival never comes in a vacuum. It never it's always in a way that glorifies God. So we can't at one day, you know, we're, you know, most of, sadly, most of the Western church is, has no interest in the Lord's day. 
is um, it's not interested in what the Word of God says, but at the same time is having all these emotional prayer meetings, charismaticism, and at the same mm-hmm. time wonders why there isn't blessings and tries to plan yeah. all these things. It's a very simple message, and this is the one of the things I really, really appreciated about the protest that you gave, was that return to the Bible. There's no kind of a silver bullet. Here's a movement that we need. We need the scriptures. We need people who are filled with joy, who want to study the scriptures and uh, want to teach their children. It, it's it seems so simple, but people don't you know want a simple answer. It's got to be something. No. Uh, I'm ranting here a bit, but it has to be something that has never been tried before, or some kind of well, yeah. they, they've all yeah. been tried before. Uh, all these marketing yeah, techniques. Uh, uh, one example of that is um, in the diocese of. Uh, Blackburn, which covers quite a bit of area. There, there have been a sort of, um, I forget the title of it now, but it, it's some sort of mission uh, that they're going to have to try and engage with the community and be, you know, and they're having a sort of, a, um, I mean, I love animals, but they're, they're having a sort of, a, you know, praying for your animals and bring your oh, pet boy. to church and have a blessing. And I love but animals all, too, and I probably get more conver- when I'm walking my dog. I got a puppy a few weeks ago, and I probably talk to more people having that puppy. But yeah. we can't become Arminians in order to influence the will. Why don't we get man's no, will to? No, it's all but, in the but, hands of God. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But the sad thing is, you know, that I mean, we commend people with obviously trying to engage. There's nothing wrong with trying to engage with your next door neighbor or your work colleagues to try and share the gospel. We commend that, but I feel that they're going down the wrong pattern to try and be popular, to try and have all these occasions, to try and get people to come to church. Whereas Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, I'm paraphrasing now, but he said things like um, marketing, um, campaigns, movements, strategies, and all of these things come to the forefront when the church has failed to be light in this world. When we have failed as Christians to be light to the gospel, then we start relying on methods, methodologies, campaigns, movements, and systems. Um, so the answer is to get back to the Bible, teach the Bible, preach the Bible, be lovers of the Bible, be Bible-focused, be God-centered, and whether it's so-called, in inverted commas, works or not, is not our issue. It is God's Mm. prerogative when he blesses and when he withholds the blessing and when he brings the blessing our duty is to be faithful to proclaim the word of god publicly privately tell people the whole counsel of god and praying in anticipation that in the lord's time he will bless his work and not relying on systems movements campaigns methods that have all been tried before um and they've come to nothing. And I always tell people, just forget about numbers. Now, obviously, it's wonderful mm. if numbers come and people are saved. We don't want to be kind of going, the, the more godly the church is, the smaller it is, or anything like that. That's right. But at the same time, we shouldn't be fixated with numbers. Like, you might have a lot of, you could have a whole load of people come in, and it, there might be a lot of, you know, you might be doing, quote-unquote, um, everything okay. You're not becoming Charles Finney spinoffs mm. or anything like that in order to get him through the door. But you might be doing everything okay, but they still not, but might not be converted. And there's, I mean, there's so much work that needs to be done within reforming the church. What is salvation? Yeah. And one of the saddest things I think in the modern day is we're not interested in what the gospel is. We're not interested mm. in the nature of grace. We're not interested in, you know, we, we, we don't want to hear that man is dead in trespass and sins. We just want to hear man is sinful, and that's it. We don't want mm. to hear he's dead and he's completely dependent upon God. But that was, yeah. what, if you go back to the Reformation, that was where you could say the rubber hit the road. Uh, oh, yeah, the reformers well, were on well. one side of fr- the free will uh, mm. debate, and then uh, the uh, the reform, and then Rome was very f- firmly, yeah. basically arguing like a lot of modern evangelicals. But we won't get too much off on a tangent here. But yeah, yeah, um, I mean, is it, is yeah, there, it's, it's, oh, yeah. Some some people fail, don't they, to realize that the Reformation, what, what quoting Martin Luther's, the bondage of the will. A lot of it was over, you know, man's will or so-called will, whether it's free to choose God or whether he's in bondage to his will. I mean, that was what a a lot of it was about, was man's will. Who is sovereign? Is it man 
or is it God? I mean, people argue about those things like the extent of the atonement and things like that. We won't get into that, but, but everybody limits the atonement. I think if we got and into that, I'd be another couple of hours. <laughs> I, th- I was going to say, if we got into that, we'd probably be here for a couple more hours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, um, but what was I going to say? Is there any information, websites you'd like people to visit or anything like that? Y- yes, yes, there is. Um, it, it's, it's only just been um, made live. It was just set up live the day before yesterday. And it's specifically dealing with the protests uh, within the Church of England. It is called menandthechurch.co.uk. And the reason why it's called menandthechurch.co.uk is set up um, because the, the liberalizing feminist movement that's called Watch, standing for Women and the Church, well, this is called Match, which is Men and the Church. So uh, it, it is seeking, with the Lord's help, to be able to give a conservative evangelical um, counteraction to the uh, liberal uh, feminist um, movement called Watch, uh, which was actually set up in 1994. And I'm surprised that nobody hasn't come along um, and said, let's have a movement called Match Men and the Church. So at least then we're having not all one side, that there is at least another side of the coin. So let's give people um, a fair playing field and they can get that from logging on to men and the church, all one word, dot co dot uk. Yeah, keep our brethren, keep our brother Stephen Holland in your prayers. Also, like, I really wanted to put this out because I think there's a lot of protesting going on, but I think it, I think a lot could be learned by watching the videos. Just be respectful, proclaim the word of God. If they shut you down or whatever, Trust that the Lord will open another avenue to share the truth. And you just standing where you're standing and you'll get opposition or whatever, that will that will speak volumes as well. Don't, I suppose, be in the right spiritual mind. Uh, be in the right frame of mind before you go. Be in prayer and um, trust in the Lord. It's it's not easy to do. Uh, I mean, I, if I was doing that, what, what you did, I, my heart would probably be jumping out through my chest. Um, it, it probably was for you as well. I mean, it but it's, you know, there is a godly way, I believe, of doing protest. Um, the Apostle Paul did in prison, and we have to do it in the right way. And I just I, I exhort those people who feel late. This isn't for everybody, by the way. It, it's not like everybody has to go protest, but some people, some ministers especially, may feel especially late to do that. And people have different gifts and different talents. Thank you so much, Stephen Holland, for coming on the show. Um, If you have any questions, megiddofilms at gmail.com. This has been Paul Flynn. May God bless you all.